<laughs> All right. Hi, guys. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm here with Abby Grace, um, who needs no introduction, um, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. So Abby Grace is a one of our industry leading photographers, a dear friend of mine, someone I really look up to in this industry. Um, so she's an expert on many, many things. But today we are going to talk to her about branding. Um, she teaches a course called Branding Foundations, which I bought, highly recommend, changed my life, changed my business. So I thought she'd be a great person to bring on. She's here with us to talk about brand, the importance of branding as a wedding photographer. So welcome, Abby. Thank you so much for having me. I cannot wait to dig into these questions. It's going to be good. Yeah. So our first question is, um, what do you think is the difference between a personal brand and a business brand? Yeah. So I was actually just talking about this with one of my clients today. So personal brands are brands that derive some of their equity, some of their value from the person behind the brand. So you think about like Caitlin James, Jenna Kutcher, Jasmine Starr. These are people who like their personality is part of what makes the brand so impactful. Mm -hmm. um, business brands are brands that derive their equity from the value of the product and how it's positioned. So you think about mm -hmm. like Jose Villa or like Bella Bell shoes. Like those are brands that like the work is what speaks the loudest, not their, I don't know very much about Jose Villa. I really don't know anything about the person behind Bella Bell shoes, but I know that the product is incredible. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the client that I was speaking with earlier today, we were talking, she was like, Oh, I feel like I should be putting more of my personality out there. And she's got one of those brands that is like, her work is so good. Like it's so mm -hmm. good. It doesn't need an introduction. And so like, she's someone who I was like, I don't necessarily think you need to talk about your kids more or like show right. the behind the scenes of the business because your work speaks for itself. And that's not to say that people who run business brands, that their work doesn't also speak for itself. But I think when you're, especially when you're new that like, if you're like, well, my work is pretty good, but like, it's also pretty comparable to like a lot of other mm -hmm. brands that are out there. If it's, an, if it feels like a comfortable option for you, sharing some of the personal side behind the brand can help people to attach a little bit more personally to you. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, your work looks very similar to like eight other photographers. If revolutionizing your work isn't necessarily like a thing you can do in the next couple of months, then maybe you do start to share a little bit more about yourself or your process or um, like what your clients are saying about you as a way to distinguish yourself. So like, okay, I'm looking at 15 photographers and all of their work feels very similar. Who is that one that we liked? Oh yeah. She's the one who like loves Paris and she has a little boy and he was so cute. And I like love their family pictures <laughs> I saw on their blog. Like it can help to distinguish you when you feel like you're still trying to figure out what is it that you want your work to look like. Mm -hmm. I love that. So I feel like, um, with personal branding, people sometimes think of it like um, I have so much of my personality and they don't see it as that is the differentiating piece. Mm -hmm. And um, I also think like with business brands, we, we sometimes look at our, just comparing the work and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, your work could stand on itself and you can also have a personal brand. So mm -hmm. I love that. So with that being said, um, do you, so with the luxury wedding photography industry, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different than the rest of the wedding photography industry from what I learned in your course. Um, yeah. What do you think is, helps you be more successful, a personal brand or a business brand, or does it matter? I think it really depends on who is it specifically that you're trying to reach. Like mm -hmm. do your, cause I think about like Caitlin James, who I, I, I don't know that I would classify Caitlin as like a luxury wedding photographer. She, she shoots gorgeous weddings. She shot luxury weddings, but like part of what makes Caitlin's brand so incredible and, and her incredible as a, as a photography educator is that Caitlin can shoot a non-luxury wedding and it still looks just as looks consistent like the rest of her yeah. work. Right. And so Caitlin is a really good, and I keep using Caitlin as an example. She's one of my, one of my branding clients, like, and I feel like she's so well-known in the wedding industry. She's, she's an easy person to point to. Yeah. Um, but like Caitlin runs a very personal brand, um, but still charges like some of the top dollar pricing. Right. So she's an example of someone who can do that well. But then I look at someone like Jose Villa and I, and I don't necessarily know that his clients are looking for a super personal connection from him. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think I'm going to make some generalizations here. It's not a rule. It is a trend that mm -hmm. the higher up you get, I think the less personal the brands tend to be, because I don't necessarily know that that's what the ideal client is looking for. Like, I don't know that they, 
necessarily need their photographer to show up and be their best friend on the wedding day. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that's really important about moving into the luxury industry is that you are not making assumptions about what you think a client wants, that you actually take the time to get to know how high end brides spend and how, um, <laughs> you know, high dollar budgets, like what is that? Talk, like talk to a wedding planner if you can. KT Mary has done some really good education on this with her, of course, the abundance plan. She's done a couple of interviews with what with um, wedding planners, getting uh -huh. on her email list. Like she's shared some really insightful information on working in the luxury industry. And so like, I, th and I, and I also look at KT Mary as an example of that, like KT Mary is very strategic about what she shares, mm -hmm. um, but she doesn't like spill her entire life on social media because she doesn't, I don't think that's what her ideal client is looking for. Um, and so I think take, I think taking your cues from people who are already there can be really helpful, but then also getting to know who that target, like who is that actual client, not a caricature of them, but like, do your research. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think about like where you could look for something like that, like, um, in taking in the same kind of, uh, Sorry, I'm totally spacing on words. I have so many thoughts running <laughs> through my head. Taking in the same kind of media that your target audience is intaking. Mm -hmm. So, like, where, what kind of magazines does your does your target audience read? Where do they get their news? Where are they shopping? What kind of blogs do they read? Are they like a Goop type person, or do they just go to Sephora and are like whatever looks good and is on sale? Give it to me. Like, figure out where your target audience shops and what they consume, and study that, mm -hmm. and let that inform your decisions um, about about what kind of personal or business brand it is that you want to build. That was a lot of information. I feel like we just skimmed to the surface. <laughs> No, no, that's so awesome. That's, that's so helpful. And that brings me to like one of the biggest things I took away from branding foundations was there are different kinds of luxury clients. Mm -hmm. And in my head, they were all just rich people who spent a lot of money. And the thing is, like you said, Caitlin James runs a luxury brand. So does KT Mary and not runs a luxury brand, but shoots luxury weddings. They mm -hmm. both maybe are booking things in similar price ranges but their ideal clients are probably entirely different. Um, and yeah. And I think there's a problem too, when we oversimplify human beings in general, I mean, like that's stereotyping, right? When we stereotype someone and then we make decisions about how we want to interact with them based on a stereotype that may or may not be true, mm -hmm. it causes friction and tension and conflict. And so if you're going to try to target a certain type of a demographic of client, you need to know who they are and what they value. Like mm -hmm. that's one of the things we talk about in Branding Foundation, not just like, okay, like where do they shop for shoes or where do they yeah. shop for clothes? Cause that's like such a cliche brand question. Mm -hmm. Like where does your brand shop? Like, like that, like, I guess that's helpful to know, but like, what's better to know is like, what's your client's number one concern when they're mm -hmm. deciding whether or not to work with you? Is their number one concern price? Is their number one concern? Are you going to make me look good? Is their number one concern? Am I going to spend all of my time taking photos? Like what is their actual worry besides the surface level? Like, am I going to get my pictures or not? Because the number one concern is going to change based on, on the dollar amount that a client is spending based on the, based on their values. Like, and, and that's another thing to, to investigate. Like, what is it that your client actually values? Like, mm -hmm. I think the higher up you get, the less, it, the less it is about like the actual photographs that people can post on Instagram and look in front of their friends. And the more it is about, I want photos that like tell the story of my family. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I really, I like, that was one of the biggest mistakes that I made in trying to bridge from like the sort of mid-range weddings into the mm -hmm. luxury market was essentially creating this caricature of a luxury client based on nothing other than assumptions that I made from people that I'd interacted with as like a teenager. And, you know, yeah. so, so rather than making assumptions and, and creating that character, actually studying real human beings, yeah. like a real marketer, and then marketing to those people with your messaging, with your images, with, with like what it is that you choose to share about your life and about your brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's easy because we don't know these people to just put them into stereotypes and caricatures. I feel like I do that too. So with that being said, would you recommend studying like people who've already gotten married and they're like your ideal client, like, like reaching out to people, real people who yeah. are like weddings you would want to shoot and figuring out where their headspace is or how would you go about actually finding these, these human beings? Yeah. I would say if you don't know anyone that sort of fits the bill, yeah. um, that try, see if you can find somebody in your industry who already works with those people, mm -hmm. um, and do not, do not ask them to pick their brain. They will hate that. <laughs> but like, is there any way that you could provide value to someone who's already working with your target audience 
so to provide you an opportunity to ask them some questions. So like, Mm -hmm. let's say there's a wedding planner and I would say wedding planners are going to be an amazing source of information, but wedding planners also get questions like this a lot from photographers who are like, I just want you to send me your high dollar clients. And so be very, be very conscious and considerate. If you are reaching out to a wedding planner that they get a lot of requests like this. And if they turn you down, it's probably not personal. It's probably, they just get this a lot. Um, but like wedding planners are great. Like venue owners are a great resource. Um, floral designers, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes even makeup, uh, I would say makeup artists, like people who work with people, if you can't talk to the actual client, Mm -hmm. talk to someone who works with the actual client and really understands them. But when you approach them of, Hey, can I ask you some questions? You've got to provide some value there. So maybe it's, Hey, can I, um, can I bring you and your team lunch one day? I, I, I have some questions, like be honest about like, I have some questions Mm -hmm. and I know you're really busy. Um, And your time is worth a lot more than like a $7 latte from Starbucks. Could I bring you and your team lunch? Or um, could I, I just like, do you need some new team headshots? Could I come Mm -hmm. in this actually, I know I'm like all over the place right now, but um, in offering specific value, like this is where following along with those people and knowing kind of what's up in their business is helpful. Cause if you're like, Hey, wedding planner, I saw that you added a new team member and you guys haven't updated your headshots. Could I come and shoot those for you? Mm -hmm. I um, was wondering if I might be able to ask you a few questions while I'm there, but like start with the serve, like offer to serve first and then ask for information after that. Um, when you just come barreling in the door with like, I have a bunch of questions because I want your clients. It's, it comes across as really self-interested and you're much more likely to get a no than if you begin with an offer. How can I serve you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. And I feel like that's, that's so helpful because like someone who, and my, where I'm at in business, there's a lack of confidence there. Mm-hmm. in serving these next level clients. So I, I think in order to really understand them, I do have to study them a little bit. Cause I have zero, I'm like, I get insecure when I raise my prices any farther because I'm like, I have no idea what this even means. <laughs> like, yeah, I get um, insecure when I raise, we raised our prices like two months ago. And the first call that we had where I had my raise prices, I was like, so here's the number. And they're like, great. Your work is worth it. And I was like, oh, yeah, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a weird feeling though. And I feel like I don't serve people as well. When you feel insecure, you need to feel confident in what you're doing, what you charge. And just like personally, like to go to sleep at night, like I'm charging this much because I feel like I am this much. Um, So I I love that. And I think, um, yeah, just, I think also just from second shooting and being around other photographers who are a lot farther than me, actually being there is different from studying their Instagram Mm -hmm. and actually seeing them and like you with your clients, you can see a different dynamic than, than you think. Um, Mm -hmm. but I love that, like serving other vendors who are serving those clients Mm -hmm. and trying to get, you know, trying to get a better understanding in person because it's totally ever the most in person. Yeah. Um, Okay. So our next question for you is, so, uh, rushing through the branding process can lead to being one of those serial serial branders. It's something we Mm -hmm. talk about in branding foundation. So, uh, what is a serial brander Mm -hmm. and how do we avoid being one? Yeah. So serial rebrander is someone who, oh, you're fine. Who gets to a point where like, it feels like something's not working and they're like, I don't know what it is Mm -hmm. and they don't know how to diagnose the problem. And so they're like, I'll just get a new website and like expecting that to be the magic fix. And then when the buzz of the new website wears off and they realize nothing in the business actually changed, they do it all over again, maybe a year or two later. Um, and so, Template shops make a lot of money off of people like this. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I will say there's nothing wrong with rebranding. If you truly feel like your brand is not in alignment with the target audience you're going after. Mm-hmm. Um, but rebranding as a band aid when some, when something's not working, but you don't know what it is, is a really good way to make sure that you rebrand again a couple years later. <laughs> and it's expensive and it costs, it can cost you a lot of money. Like mm-hmm. if you not just, not just money in terms of like purchasing a new website template, but like it can cost you credibility because you're looking like in front of your target audience, like you don't know what you want. So like, why would they trust you with their money if you're not even sure, sure who you are as an artist? Um, and so the sort of antidote to that is not sexy and, and it's not flashy. And that's, and I think that's why people gravitate towards the website thing, because it's immediately gratifying. Like, yeah. look, I put a new visual face to my brand. Isn't that sexy? Like now we can talk about it on social media. Yeah. And it makes me feel good. You get that like hit of it's dopamine. So you feel like, oh, everything's organized now. Like it's great. Yes. And it's pretty, but if the, if the foundation and the heart of the brand has not been established, Mm -hmm. that's where, you know, a year or two later, you're going to find like, oh wait, something's out of alignment here. Mm -hmm. And that's really like the whole purpose of branding foundations is to help people figure out what does alignment look like for me? And then taking 
that alignment that starts like on the, on the interior of the brand and letting that inform sort of clothes that you put on the brand, which we refer to it as like inputs and outputs. So like you start with the inputs and the inputs are going to be that sort of invisible under the ground layer of your brand. So your vision for where you want the brand to go, your um, target audience, your values, the strengths that you bring to the table, your messaging, your voice as a brand, allowing all of that to then inform, okay, now what kind of clothes are we going to put on the brand to attract the type of people that we're trying to attract Mm -hmm. instead of just slapping a new coat of paint on things and hoping that that will cover up the fact that the, you know, the walls are actually crumbling behind those like eight metaphors at a time. But so, (laughs) so figuring out what, what are my strengths? What are my unique strengths as a brand owner? What are, what do I value? Because what you value is going to, is going to directly inform what sort of like how you build your business. Like, for example, I value freedom is a huge value of mine. Like Mm -hmm. having the freedom to be fully on at work, not trying to like be, be mom and be at work at the same time. And then when I'm in mom mode to be fully free from my work. So I don't keep email on my phone. I don't keep social media on my phone after 3 PM when I leave my office. Um, that directly informs the kind of work that we do and the sort of relationships that we have with our clients. Like Mm -hmm. we just recently recently, I mean, within the last few years, pivoted out of weddings and into brand photography because I value my freedom on weekends. Like I want to be able to be home with my family. I don't want to have meetings in the evenings. Um, I don't want to have engagement sessions in the, I want to be there for dinner time and bath time with my son. Um, and so when we start with the inputs, when we begin to form those, when when we begin to, to dress our brand and to put clothes on the brand and give it a, a visual face, it's going to be a lot more consistent than if we're changing outfits every 15 minutes, because we don't know who we are on the inside. Does that make sense? Yes. That makes so much sense. I love that. And I I think the missing piece is that it takes time to figure out. It does. And it's not sexy work. It's not fun. And even when I was taking branding foundations, I was honestly a little overwhelmed because I didn't know how much I didn't know. Yeah. And I thought I was, I'm definitely a, I've been a rebrander and I've done that so many times. And I was like, this is why I'm doing this because Mm -hmm. I haven't done the work to figure out. And I love your one exercise that's like, but why, but why, but why, but mm-hmm. why? And I didn't have answers for the last four, which I just had to like sleep on it and like think about my life and figure out what mm-hmm. it is. And I'm still not there. I'm still like, like you're the fourth why mm-hmm. but in your exercise. Um, but it takes time. And I think that's why so many, and this is just my observation, people who are really far in our industry, it takes them a long time because they've really thought and pursued a lifetime of this mission and of this mm-hmm. why and it's clear and their branding wasn't re re serial done a million times yeah know? or if it was you don't see that part because once they finally hit the thing that it really was once they finally got the brand in alignment the outputs in alignment with the inputs that's what when things finally took off for them wow. so like like I always liken it to um my dad makes turkey stock every year after Thanksgiving. So he takes like the bones and like the meat that's left, meat that's left on the bones and puts it in a stock pot, covers it with water mm-hmm. and boils it down and then adds water and boils it down again and again and again. And it takes like, like eight to 10 hours to make this turkey stock. But when you're done and you give it the time that it needs, what you're left with is turkey stock. That's great for making soup, right. Or mm-hmm. whatever re- kind of recipe that you might want to use it in. If you rush it, you like turn it all the way on high and like add water once boils down and an hour later, you're like, we're done. What you have is like water with a vague essence of Turkey, which mm-hmm. is gross. Like nobody wants that. And it's not good for anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it is something that we have to let take our time. There's this, um, Alex Pang wrote a book called rest and inside yeah. in the book rest, he talks about the default mode network, which mm-hmm. is the subconscious part of your brain that continues to puzzle through, um, like problems when you're not actively thinking about. So you have your conscious brain and then your subconscious brain, which is the default Mm -hmm. mode network. Um, and, and like, that's why if you're like actively thinking about an issue and you put it aside and you go take a shower, why the answer pops into your head, maybe while you're in the shower or like after a good night's rest is because your, your subconscious brain is barely less active than your conscious, but they puzzle through things in different ways and process Mm -hmm. information in different ways. And so like, you can't just sit down on a Tuesday afternoon and like, well, I've got two hours. I'm going to establish my brand real quick because yeah. this, unless it's something that you've already been working on for a while, because those like your brain needs time to let those things rattle around for a while. And it takes time. But when you give it the time that it's worth, what you're left with is a product that's more in alignment with what it is like that you were created to do, mm-hmm. um, or the kind of the unique kind of value that you can bring to the market. And when we rush it, we may end up 
jotting off in the wrong direction because we were so eager to get an answer that we did, we, we, we hit go before we were ready. Like Mm -hmm. I thought for the longest time, I was like, I'm going to be like the anniversary photographer. Like, I know it's not a competition, but like, if it was, I would want to win when it comes to being the number one anniversary photographer. And I think it was because I was so desperate to be known for something that I was just like, whatever the first answer is that comes to mind. So I spent like a year and a half building up this, like Abby Grace, the anniversary photographer before I realized like, I don't actually like, I love my clients, but like, this is not where my heart is. My heart is, is I, I don't like engagement sessions have never been my favorite part of a wedding photography experience. Yeah. It was always the wedding day that I loved more and anniversary sessions are special, really special in a different way, but it was kind of like shooting engagement sessions. And I'm like, this is not my favorite part of working with my clients. Why am I forcing this? And it was because I grasped the first thing that popped in my mind, like anniversary sessions. I don't see a lot of other people offering that, that that'll be me. And I didn't give myself time to process, Hey, is this really like not just in alignment with what I want to do, but like, is this in alignment with where I am the most uniquely qualified? And the answer to that was no, Mm -hmm. and that's okay. But like, and I think sometimes we do need those false starts of like trying something and it's not working. You're like, why isn't this working? Because it's coming up against that. Why isn't it working that you realize, oh, this was never where I was supposed to be in the first place. Let's explore where I should be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's what we all do is we just grasp at the, the, the fastest thing. And I think Mm -hmm. even branding now is for me, it's harder and it's confusing because we're used to Instagram and instant gra- gratification. And like, I love how you said that, um, YouTube and just like clicks, likes all these things yep. and, and it's flashy. It's all flashy. It's all fun. Like I can make a hundred reels and they're just great interaction, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. but there's no heart of the brand being established. Right. And, and it's all vanity data too. Like it's vanity, yeah. the vanity metrics. Like yeah. it's like, if you sit down at your inbox and you're like, I'm going to go to inbox zero today. It's like, great. Did you spend six hours doing that? Because like, that's not, I don't mean this offensively email is not actually the work that you're getting paid to do email is part right. of the process, but like, do I get paid per email or do I get paid per shoot that I book? Mm-hmm. I get paid for shoots. And so while email is essential, me getting through my entire inbox for the day isn't actually like a mark of, did I do anything of consequence that day? And I think the same thing can be said for like Instagram, like, okay, great. You got, you know, this, Mm -hmm. this thing went, went viral, right? Okay. So you have, you have a reel that you uploaded and it went viral and it's got 5 million views on it. Fantastic. Did you book anything off of that? Like, or, or if you did, but like, did you, what did that do for you besides just make you feel good about yourself? Mm -hmm. Because you cannot pay your rent in likes or views. You have right. to have actual dollars in order to do that. Right. Exactly. And I, I think that the, the, that discovery piece is so rushed so many mm-hmm. times. And I like for me for next, next month, I booked, or I plan, I'm planning to do eight different shoots with eight different couples at eight different places, because I don't know where I like to shoot. Yeah. So I just don't know. And I feel like I'm trying to answer that question without being in the field. And I'm yes. like, oh, you, you and know? you can't substitute experience. There is exactly. no, yeah. there's, I love what you said that we try to rush that discovery process and you can, you can't, mm-hmm. and you can read as many books as you want to. It'd be like a doctor studying to be a doctor who only ever read textbooks and like pass the bar exam with flying colors because they knew all the theory, but then you put them in an actual exam room with a patient and they're like, I've never done this before. Like you can't substitute and you can't rush experience. And mm-hmm. that's, I mean, I love that you're going, I love that you recognize that and you're going out and you're doing eight shoots with eight different couples, because that's a way to like hasten the discovery Mm -hmm. process by just a ton of exposure to whatever it is you're trying to discover. Do I actually like this? Or what do I like? What am I drawn to? But at the same time, like you can't short it's, um, Ashlyn Carter always says you can't outsource your pushups. Like if you want to get strong, you have to do pushups. You can't outsource that. Um, and, and like, it's not, it's not sexy and it's not a fun thing, but it, but it, it, there is so much, growth and so much goodness to be had in that discovery process. If you learn who you are, you learn, you learn why you like the things that you like. And so when you finally do arrive at that place of alignment, it, it sticks and it feels satisfying and you're content in a way that you couldn't be if you had like landed on that exact same answer from day one. Cause it didn't, there was no work to get there. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it always feels like, oh, it's not flashy. It's not fun, but it will be once you reach it. Otherwise everything is feels pointless and like a mess. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think that's also like, does it stick too? like, if you do uh-huh. like, 
let's say, let's say you go viral. Great. Okay. Well, like, what about the next post? That doesn't mean the next one's going to go viral. Like that doesn't mean that. And, and if it did again, is it contributing to your bottom line? I think we are so drawn to like the quick and the shiny mm-hmm. that we forget about like one of my favorite authors, Cal Newport, who wrote the book, um, deep work. Yeah. Best, book, I best love business book, book yes. ever. If you haven't mm-hmm. read it, people read it. But his podcast recently, he's been talking about this concept of slow productivity of like, not just what do I want to accomplish today or this week, but like, what am I trying to get done this year? Mm -hmm. How does that contribute to what I'm trying to get done in the next five years? Because that's the kind of business I want to build. I I don't want to build a business that has me scrambling to keep like frenetically scrambling to keep up with every new trend because, you know, if this one doesn't go viral, then, oh crap, I'm screwed. Instead, I want to build a business where the marketing is doing itself like when I'm not, when I'm not at my desk or right. like, if I want to take a two month sabbatical that I don't have to worry that I'm going to come back and my business is falling to pieces because I've built, I've built enough systems or I've, I've, I've marketed my business in such a way that it's continuing to run mm-hmm. quote unquote without me. And I, um, yeah, that's when you, when you reach that place of alignment in your brand, like that contributes to a le- a level of consistency and dependability that those sort of like people who truly are, I mean, overnight successes, like someone who got really famous really fast, don't necessarily have that same type of predictability and consistency because there's that worry of like, oh no, it was, what if this is just a flash in the pan? Whereas Mm -hmm. that consistent productivity over years and that slow build, I don't have to worry if we have a slow year, because I know that like we've proven over the past 12 years that if we have a slow year, we'll pick it up again next year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel like we find these pieces at every stage of our business, like even like I'm very confident in my equipment. I know I've shot with that lens, that, that lens. I know I'm not going to shoot on these two lenses. And that only came from six years of shooting yeah. on all these different lenses. And I'm like, I'm not exploring that. Like, yep. And then that's better, inst- better decisions moving forward because you have more of a pool of knowledge to yeah. pull from. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So I'm going to transition to our last question here. Um, so transitioning to getting in front of people. So once we have um, done the work to establish that a brand like we're talking about from the inside out, how do we go about advertising ourselves, getting that exposure? Yeah. So, I mean, I do for as much as I just dumped on social media, (laughs) (laughs) I do think social media is helpful, but, um, social media is only a piece of the marketing puzzle. Um, it is, this is actually, we're doing a pop-up podcast right now called Unsinkable Marketing. This is what we're talking about on Unsinkable Marketing is the concept of like, we need to build a marketing plan that like, if one piece goes down, the entire ship doesn't sink. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that like social media is a part of that, but like, what about search? Like what, what, like when people Google you, like, or when people Google the problem that you solve, like, okay, DC wedding photographer, you meet the desire of people who are searching for Mm -hmm. DC wedding photographer. Do you pop up on that? Um, like how easy is it to find you when people Google your name? What do they find? Like, um, and I don't mean like, do you have weird Facebook posts that pop up or tweets or anything like that. I mean, like how easy is it for someone to stumble upon you? Um, so going back to the, like, how do we advertise ourselves? Blogging is not as, um, I don't want to say not as effective as it used to be. Cause I used to blog like every day and we had hundreds of page views and like, it was very gratifying, but like, We don't see the same type of traction with that anymore. However, we do see SEO being like a bigger and bigger factor in how our clients are finding us. And so, and blogging is a huge part of that. So like I blog every session, um, pretty much every session that I shoot, I blog tips for clients. Um, Mm -hmm. So like if you're a wedding photographer trying to get in front of like the luxury market, okay, why don't you do some research and blog about your research? Like, why don't you blog like um, the, like maybe you're really into fashion and you're like, oh my gosh, there are like, I'm totally making this up. Like Mm -hmm. Oscar de la Renta just came out with a line of X, Y, Z that I'm really excited about. And I really wish my brides would Mm -hmm. have this on their wedding day. Blog about it. Like blog about like, Hey, five dresses that you don't know about that Oscar De La Renta just came out with that. You totally, that's a really long, don't use that yeah. headline. That's a horrible headline, <laughs> um, blogging is a great way to do that. Social media is a great way to do that. But I would just say if, as you're using social media, like just what's the end game here is the mm-hmm. end game to go to get a ton of views or is the end game to turn those views into followers, into clients. Mm-hmm. Um, newsletters can be a good place for that. If there's a reason that you have a newsletter, um, we don't, I don't use my newsletter for my branding clients. My newsletter is for our students. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have, um, if you're not like teaching, I would, I would caution, like, why are you doing a newsletter? But that like, 
therapy. Corinne Jasinski is actually a good example of someone who used that really well. She had a, she's, um, she has like a download that, um, of wedding songs, like that she has yeah. had as an opt-in. Yeah, and she, I mean, like that thing blew up and she's booked <laughs> clients from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she's doing really, really well. So you can use it, just be strategic about how you, but my, my, my bigger recommendation here is to spread out. So like, if you ever find yourself on thin ice, the, the mm-hmm. authorities tell you to spread your weight out. So like lay yeah. down and roll to safety because it distributes your weight over a larger amount. And that way you don't fall through the ice. Same thing with marketing here. Like if we're trying to market or advertise, do not put all of your eggs in one basket, especially Mm -hmm. a basket that hangs on the arm of Mark Zuckerberg, because we saw this happen last year when Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp all went down. There were thousands of business owners who were like, what am I going to do? Like, I I have no other way to reach my people. And Mm -hmm. like, if that's you, that's a sign it's time to spread out. Maybe you start blogging. Do not underestimate the value of relationships with other people in your industry. Those can, can be incredibly powerful. So maybe that means grabbing lunch with an up and coming wedding planner or another photographer that you can pass referrals back and forth. Um, and then finally, I mean, there are the options of paid, paid, um, paid advertising. We don't yeah. utilize those. Um, we've done them in the past, but I, we just found that's not where our target audience was spending time. Yeah. And so I think to back up that question, just gave you some recommendations on like how to market. But I think the primary question you need to be able to answer is where are your people finding you? Where are they looking for you? Because if they're looking for you somewhere and they're not finding you there, that's a good idea for you to get on that place. So like maybe yeah. you, your, your target audience is using Pinterest a lot. You should be on Pinterest. Like mm-hmm. my target audience isn't on Pinterest so much. We haven't put a ton of, of, time into that, but like, it's something we're exploring for the future. Um, but just like, where are your people hanging out and meet them there? Don't try to make them meet you somewhere else. Just figure out where they already are and then go meet them there with your marketing. Yeah. I love that. So I just had a follow-up question to that. So if you are trying to, you know, widen where you are, what if your content isn't stuff like you're like, I'm not like, Oh my God, I would love to shoot this again. You know, if I have like a shoot or like you, like you said, you blog almost every shoot. My business is like, is in a place where not everything I want to do again, like I didn't love that place or I didn't okay. something. Would you recommend if you're like in my a beginning, more of a beginner in the business or somewhere in the middle, um, blogging everything to get the exposure anyway, or trying to like, where's that happy place between creating a consistent brand and I shot here, I could get the SEO boost. Yeah. And, You know what I mean? Yeah. I would say if you can blog it in a way that you feel like is on brand, Mm -hmm. um, then do it. And, and, um, I mean, there are shoots that we haven't blogged because I'm like, eh, I don't really, I think it was a great shoot. I'm really proud of what I did, but like, I don't necessarily want to book more businesses yeah, exactly. like that. So yeah. we don't blog those ones, okay. but I might use some of those photos in like a roundup post of like, Hey, eight unexpected ways that you can use your brand photos and then screenshots of clients who've done stuff with them. So yeah. I would say, if you're like, I need the SEO points, blog it, be selective about what you're showing. And then I would not use any keywords that like you, so like, let's say I'm just going to make this up. Let's say you shot at sugar plum, foundation, (laughs) country club, sugar plum foundation, country club. Okay. And you're like, I really don't ever want to shoot there ever again, because the experience with the staff was awful or, or I, I I didn't like, I didn't like how it looked. Mm -hmm. Are there any parts of it that you could blog and talk about that? Maybe the bride had like a killer dress or like a really fun pair of shoes, blog it and mention those things in the body of the copy. Do not mention sugar plum foundation country club so that if people right, Google right. that your results don't come up. Does that make does that? No, that makes complete <laughs> sense. Cause I feel like I've, I've like shot myself in the foot before by marketing something. And I'm like, oh, got another, yeah, and it's like, like, I don't even want to go. Yeah, exactly. Show what you want to shoot. And so is there anything from that wedding or from that session that you do want to show and then show that part and talk yeah. about it in a way that the, the, those keywords are going to help people find you for similar things. Mm-hmm. Um, but then don't show the parts that you don't like, for example, um, I don't know if this is like still a thing, but when I first started shooting weddings, people, there was like this Pinterest photo of like a bride and groom holding hands around a door. Yeah. Um, and like, everyone's like, Oh, I want that photo. And I was like, I hate that photo. <laughs> I hate that photo because most people just want it. Cause it's a cute, it's a cute image, but like the real reason that photo was taken because it was a bride and groom who wanted to pray together before their wedding day, but they didn't want to see each other. And I'm like, if that's why we're taking the picture, 
I will take that picture all day long. But if you just want the cute, like he, 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 the camera shows the two of us, but like, we can't see each other. I don't want to take that photo because it, it eats up a lot of time on the timeline when we yeah. could be shooting bridal portraits or something. And so when I had weddings that took that photo, I never blogged it because I didn't want to encourage other brides to ask for the same mm-hmm. thing. So I still blog the wedding. I just never blogged that photo because I didn't want to get asked for it again. Yes. That makes so much sense. Uh, thank you. Okay. I hope I don't get major shade from your photographers who are like, I love that photo. It's okay if you like that photo. It just didn't resonate <laughs> but, with me. But everybody has things. And I feel like that's even our job as photographers to educate our clients on, hey, that's going to feel a little bit fake. Like you're not yeah. really right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I've done it before. And are you sure? You know? Yeah. Um, and they might, they might be like, oh yeah, you're right. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, all right, Abby. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, and thank you for answering all our questions. Um, this was so, so helpful. I'm really excited to put everything into action that you, you know, you talked about today. And do you have, did you have anything else you wanted to add about anything we talked about? No, this was great. I'm so grateful. Thanks for having me on here. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Have Thanks. A good girl. Thanks.